Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Coach's Corner. We are sorry about the delay in the start. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, but we got them all worked out. So here we are. Uh, while we wait for everyone to turn their videos on, I'm just going to say a few words and let you all know that these guys love answering questions. Please drop all of the questions you have in the chat on Facebook and they will do their best to get to all of them. And if we happen to run out of time, they're also really good about going back through the comments later and answering anything that we didn't have time to get to. So please, please let us know what's on your mind. With that, I'm going to disappear and I'm gonna hand it off to Duke Bronis. Great, hey, welcome everybody. Uh, we apologize. It seems like technology changes all the time and uh, we're still getting used to it changing. Uh, we had to turn on a couple of new options. Uh, big thanks to Alanon for uh, finding those real quick. Uh, well, semi-quick after uh, we tried everything we could. Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the show, uh, including our hosts. We have, uh, of course, is uh, Royal Highness Sean. Uh, we have Gaff Bjork, Jarl Alanon, and Viscount Tristan, and myself. Um, I think all of us kind of wanted to do this show because uh, I think, you know, as trainers, we actually a lot of times draw from other sports. We ask people, I know I ask people what they've done um, uh, in other sports and maybe some th activities that you don't even think of that actually feed into uh, uh, what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, uh, specifically, uh, even things around flow that, that feed in from other activities. So uh, we're going to, we'll start, uh, we had a great conversation uh, prior to uh, actually getting on here and then all this problem getting on here, but we're happy for everybody that could stay with us and thank you very much. Um, so uh, each of us have a little bit of background, a little different background in sports or activities or, or training with somebody that had a sports background. Um, and uh, instead of like running through the list of those things, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I, I think I'll start out with uh, His Royal Majesty, Sean, I apologize. Um, I, I know that you uh, you had some uh, some squires that had some really big mar martial arts backgrounds and, and sports backgrounds, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I I started doing SEA combat when I was very young, uh, doing pel work, and that was the first a real sport that I I really was any good at. Um, everything else I'd done before that was was street ball you know, baseball, football, whatever. Um, so I didn't really come to this with a, with an extensive sports background, but as a trainer, I have worked with a number of people that have uh, come from a, a wide variety of uh, other sports um, and have been, been able to find a way to use what they had already learned over a lifetime of sports activity or martial arts activity and being able to make those connections between you know what what they've already trained their body to do and how that is applicable uh to our sport um i had one of my former squires duke michael who came to us with a fully complete martial arts background and you know that's something that we see a lot of we see a lot of people that come to us with martial arts background and, and they want to try to kind of make it all the same and and use some of the same techniques and there's a lot of that stuff that is applicable um, but I think to some extent you have to learn SCA combat as its own thing first, and then you can make that transition and start applying those things that, that come from those, those other backgrounds and those other sports, um, as they are applicable. Um, cause I know for, for me, when I, when I was teaching Michael coming from a martial arts background to, to our sport, like ours is a sport where while footwork is absolutely critical to what we do, we're not using our feet as a weapon. So the stance that I use was just a little bit different than the stance that he's using from a lifetime of martial arts. And that is going to be counterintuitive initially coming from, uh, coming from some of those other sports. And it may or may not be, a, may, not, may or may not be applicable. Um, but once you understand a little more about what we do and you learn our sport as an individual thing, then you can start applying, uh, applying some of these other things. Um, I think probably one of my favorite stories about having and made that direct connection from a previous sport. Uh, it was when I was working with uh, Duke Ashir from Calentier um, uh, down in Springfield um, uh, before he'd won crown. He was a place kicker in college 
Uh, and I was talking to him about being on the balls of your feet, uh, you know, which is something we talk about a lot. And he just wasn't quite getting it. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll just set up like you're going to kick a field goal. And he, you know, leans in and sure enough, his balls are on the, on his feet. And I'm like, okay, so why are you, why are you leaning forward like that? And he's like, oh, so all my energy goes forward. My momentum goes. And then he's like, oh crap. And when he figured out that direct link between what he had spent a lifetime doing as a, as a, a kicker, a football kicker, and the idea that being on the balls of your feet takes your momentum forward and allows you um, to advance uh, the fight. Um, you know, it was just one of those very direct links taking somebody who had played at a, co a collegiate level. Um, and, and we take what you already know how to do and we show you how that applies to, to, to what we're doing here. So there's just a couple of examples of some folks that I've worked with. Um, and there's, I've got countless, countless stories of, you know, baseball, football, golf, tennis, um, you know, just anything. We, we, we always find these connections. And when we can teach people the, you know, basically they already know how to do this. We just have to make that connection. Yeah, uh, Brian just wanted me to talk about, uh, go next here. And um, some of the examples I remember seeing when I came into the SCA, I didn't have much of an athletic background. I did some martial arts, but not really enough uh, for me to have a solid footing. I learned most of it in the SCA, but I've run across a number of fighters over the years that have taken very strong influences from uh, the sport background. Uh, for those, some of these remember uh, Duke Osis or Jarl Osis from uh, Eldemir. He was a hockey player and he adapted using a side-by-side -side stance instead of having one foot in front of the other. And he, I, I was asked him, why on earth do you do that? I've never, never seen anybody do that. And he said, well, it's because a couple of reasons. One is I don't have one leg sticking forward. It, it makes the other person reach forward because both of your legs are are farther out of the target zone. But more importantly, and I'd watch him do this all the time, he says, I really like lateral movement. He used lateral movement like he was skating. And when you would step forward, he would step to the side and he would have a very, very vulnerable angle he would fire at you from, um, or when you were vulnerable. And, you know, he would get, he'd hit shoulders a lot, he'd hit outside of the head a lot. Uh, but it was a way that he adapted his, his sport into what the SCA fighting part did both from a defensive advantage and from an offensive advantage. So, um, Alan, why don't you go ahead? Uh, you come at a different, uh, and, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, uh, you come at it a little bit a different way, and I can totally see it. After you mention it, I'm like, oh man, that's just perfect sense. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, so glad we were able to get on tonight. It, it yeah, looked really uh, touch and go there for a second. But uh, um, as I've talked about, my journey started with playing a lot of basketball in middle school and high school. And then I played for as long as I had people to play with, you know, probably stopped really playing in my late 30s. Um, and, uh, you know, when I found the SCA, it was, I could tell immediately that it was going to meet two needs that I was looking for coming out of the sport. Um, one of which in, in, in basketball, you probably play more one-on-one, -on -one, um, two on two, three on three, but a lot of one on one than you'll ever play five on five full court, um, unless you just only belong to a league. But if you're going to go to the gym, and you're going to work with people, you're going to work by yourself, you know, you're going to, you're going to play a lot of one on one. And the, the, what one on one basketball with someone being on defense and someone being on offense looked like to me was what it looked like, you know, two people fighting. Um, you know, when one person was particularly full on offense and the other person kind of went on full on defense, that looked a lot alike. And the thing that's important, I think, with all the sports that we're going to talk about tonight um, and then SCA combat is it's not a one to one. It's not a it's not like anything in basketball prepared for me to swing the stick, but basketball prepared me to throw convincing fakes with all of my body to get a split second advantage to be able to get the shot I want off with the stick. So, I mean, I had to learn how to still throw a stick once I started playing, but I didn't really have to be taught the benefit and the basic mechanics of throwing a really good convincing fake. Um, that came straight to me. I mean, I mean, it's like, I, 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 th I was throwing a fake 
on the uh, first day I went to practice and I remember throwing a fake at my authorization and they were like, you know, this, this is the mid eighties and, and not a lot of people were throwing really good convincing fakes back then. So, you know, it just, it was just something that came to me. Um, I think the other things that, ba that basketball helped me with, with it from a transition from, you know, playing basketball to SCA combat is the core strength that you develop playing basketball um, and the strength in your legs. So much of basketball is trying to have a really good balance so that you can move in any direction at any time, uh, explode with that movement. And the explosion oftentimes is a jump or it's a lunge or it's a, a you know, a quick dash one way or even super fast lateral movement. Um, but all of that stuff develops your leg and develops your leg strength and then develops your core strength. Um, and so much of my actual fighting style relies heavily on my, you know, the strength of my legs. Uh, you know, and it's everyone goes, yeah, but... It, everyone when they fight they move it's like well it's not just the movement and it's not the movement at speed it's it's the explosion into the movement and it's also it is probably the primary area that i generate or the primary area that i generate power with my shots uh, they they come from my legs i'm i'm in a slightly tensed position or even if i'm standing up straight there'll be a tense in my legs like i'm getting ready to jump and then i can throw out the shot from there so you know, it was very, very similar to me, and I was able to use a lot of the skills. And I've got some videos that I can show uh, a little later in our discussion, you know, sort of what a three-point stance is, the offensive aspect of it, and then also what really good defensive one-on-one -on -one basketball, how that also looks like when we talk about your guard. Um, you know, there's a reason why they call certain basketball positions a guard, and I think it actually transcends really well to you know to, to SCA combat so um, you know that was my journey and the second part real quickly was uh, was the melee the things that I learned in team sports and, and the team aspect of basketball and how you're supporting each other how you're looking for each other how you're trying to you, you know you try to understand your your own team's weaknesses and you try to understand the other team's weaknesses and you support your weaknesses and you exploit the other team's weaknesses I mean that's that's SCA Melee in a nutshell. So, uh, you know, those, those were extremely important fundamental lessons that I got that I was able to bring into SCA Combat. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. And I think uh, I look forward to seeing those videos because I think that the defensive play video is going to be very close to what we see in boxing as well. So, um, Auric, you have a little background in a little bit of football, I believe, right? Uh, a little bit. I started playing uh, organized sports when I was 10. So uh, I did them all through uh, all through the end of uh, elementary school, middle school, and, uh, and high school. Um, I played football, played baseball, played, played basketball. But um, the big light went on for me when I started fighting in the SCA. When I realized that I could, when I first started fighting in the SCA, I didn't realize how much would would translate into into combat. But then as things went on. As Elon says, you know, um, melee turned out to be a team sport and dealing with how that work, misdirection plays, things like that. And also to, it moved up into simple misdirection plays in football. Everyone knows about the, count, the counter and things like that. Translate into a fake. That's what a, that's what a, a counter play is. It's, it's, a, it's a fake on a football field. You can do the same thing in, in your shots. Uh, it wasn't a lot of um, the the actual team sport aspect that translated directly to this. A lot of the drills, um, a lot of the the one-on-one the -on -one drills for learning how to break down, uh, get past a defender to get to a, a running back if you're if you're tackling the stance of a linebacker. Not a lot of three-point stance uh, that you'll do do in SCA fighting. But if on a linebacker, as you're standing up and you're reading how the play develops you're reading tells of people and those tells tell you where to go. Same point. If you're a uh, uh, offensive or defensive lineman, you can tell what you, you know, as the game progresses, you learn to read the game and you learn to read your, your adversary, you know, as they're going to show you where they're going to move to block you, or they're, you're going to try and fake out where you're, go you're going. And those translate 
directly into this eye shifts, looking at looking at a certain area, looking off certain you know, certain things. Quarterbacks do it all the time. So things like that translated directly into into fighting for me. The ability to to, to glance a leg a couple of times if I catch someone watching my eyes um, was great. You know, if I catch someone watch watch my eyes, I'm going to glance a leg a couple of times and I'll throw that shot a couple of times, and then glance the leg and throw high. I mean, it's something really simple that we that we all do, and we don't even think about it anymore. But things like that tra- translated, and uh, as as Tristan pointed out and, and Sean pointed out, getting up on the balls of your feet and and moving, being in an athletic position, the ability to move laterally to go one way one way or the other, or go go at an at an angle, puts you in a position to deal with someone who may be faster or or maybe. Um, aggressive with you to get out of that way and and throw that shot as a, as a passing shot or something all right so um i guess i'm the last one here but i'm gonna i'm gonna cover a couple of things and i just out of everyone else's conversation i think uh um first i came out of some football some track some i could never hit a baseball worth a damn i was very uncoordinated uh, i could run fast uh and soccer um, but most of probably what I came into the SA was with martial arts and uh, some kickboxing. Um, the thing that really got me here was kendo. And uh, I, I quickly found out that uh, sword and shield is nothing like two-handed sword. So that was a, that was a disaster at the beginning. And, uh, but it was okay because I had to spend, you know, three months at Nepal anyway. So it was all good. And <laughs> uh, back in the day. Uh, but I think one of the biggest pieces that, uh, you know, some of the other folks I know that uh, have stayed at the top of the game for a long time and, and been around for a long time or, or really went fa- up fast, came out of, you know, really out of highly intensive sports background. And I think it's, I, I think it drives down to, you know, some of what Alan on said about core strength. I think that's a, that's a huge, huge one. Um, I think in a lot of cases, Um, we are still in a mentality and we're going to talk about this a little later. We're in a mentality where you have to fight to learn to throw a stick in the SCA. And that isn't hundred percent right. And in fact, it's probably one of the best ways to drive yourself to hurt yourself. If you don't have the strength to do the things that you're trying, that leads to injury. And that's why core strength and, and, and overall strength, even you don't have to be big giant man or woman. You just have to have strength enough in, in your muscles to support your sport. And I mean, that's why football has a lot of strength training. Uh, basketball has a lot of agility training. Uh, martial arts covers, you know, probably a lot more on the agility side and, and uh, some on the, the punching side and kicking side, lower leg strength and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's so we, we get a lot of strength training, a lot of training out of all those things. And I think that's where we're going to go next is um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what pieces of the things we did that we brought into the SCA, we tell others to do and uh, and and how they help. Um, I, I know, like, I think even Duke uh, Alark had, uh, you know, really strong uh, tennis background and, uh, like uh, semi-pro or something. And, but, you know, I think what happens in a lot of these sports is we come in with a, you know, that, that people come in from a sport, especially if it's right away with discipline about what they have to do to become good at something. And I, I I think that's, that's one of the, the, the big things that kind of drives us uh, and the people that, that are really driven, that stays in their mind are already strong from the sport they did. And they just keep on going in, in a different sport. Um, I'm just going to cover a real quick uh, question because I was watching it as well. And uh, we, it, it's a comment from the, the from folks out there. One was uh, in the linear, uh, in, in the Coach's Corner page, there was a, a, a article posted about rotational movement and uh, power generation and and things like that. But in that, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ways and, and there's a lot of different ways to throw a sword. I don't think there's any one perfect way. 
And we will probably find out more ways to throw a sword as we get to, to the hundredth year, <laughs> you know? So, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because the thing I'm going to bring out of this, uh, I'm not going to dive into that because that was a whole episode by itself that, that, that thread was so long, but, uh, this person said that they can only think of darts and fencing as some of the, the, the ways that the sword snaps uh, in some of different styles in, in the SCA. And at 100%, I know people that actually like, hey, have you played darts? This is how your hand moves when you release and, and that straight flow through the dart, you know, or, you know, the lunges inside of, of a fencing attack and things like that. So again, it's just, helping a person get to the end of something. So if they have a great understanding of something, we're trying to get to that point where they can understand how to do it. So, um, Sean, there was another question. Do you want to cover that one and then cover some of the things that you brought from other sports into help train? Yeah, I, I've actually got some some thoughts on uh, on that first bit there as far as, you know, other sports that that have you uh, you know, manipulating other op objects, right? Um, baseball swing is very much like a great sword. Um, functions a lot the same way. Um, our our basic hip rotation that we the well that I use to uh, to to start my shots um, is the same hip rotation you use in baseball and uh, in golf in particular. Um, uh, you know, I'd also noticed that. Um, uh, when I was in the military, I played a lot of racquetball. It was just something I really enjoyed. And, and as I was playing racquetball, I just noticed that the, the, the rotation in the racket to be able to get a good snap on that, on that ball is precisely the same rotation that I use to get to, to finish a flat snap. You know, there's a lot of body mechanics that is involved in, in our flat snap to begin with. But when you get, for me, when I get down to the end of it, to be able to get that snap and to, to close my hand and to be able to, to, to get that punch right at the end, it's very similar um, to, uh, to racquetball. Um, it's also very similar to the, the uh, rotation you use in, in service uh, in tennis as well. Um, so there's, there's, you know, when we're talking about you know, different objects or, or different sports that use, you know, an object in your hand. Um, so many of those things are directly a, applicable to, to what we do. And it's just, again, finding that connection and, and figuring out how to, you know, how to, how to make that wrist snap um, to, you know, put that into your, into your sword mechanics uh, to be able to get that extra, extra punch on the end there. Um, so were you talking about the second question that we had on there? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, that second that second question I see. Right. Yeah. So the question we have that said, uh, as someone coming from from uh, foam fighting LARP, uh, wow. what parts uh, do you guys think uh, I can transfer over? Um, that's a discussion we've had quite a bit uh, on the show. Honestly, um, you know, Duke's fan uh, down in Anstiora was was on. We talked about foam fighting quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that he had said was there's, you know, that that the foam weapons tend to be faster. Um, and, um, and, you know, but they really aren't, they don't have the same kind of levels of protection that we do. So, uh, he was saying that he actually got more, he got injured more doing foam fighting than he did SCA combat. Um, but I mean, foam fighting is, is, uh, you know, for, as, as far as I can see, it is a direct gateway, um, to SCA combat. You know, if we look at, if we look at three three different levels of, of interest there, there's there's the foam fighting, there's retained combat, and then there's live steel combat like the ACL stuff, um, the HMB, you know all that, and um, you know those are all different gateways to one to the other. You know if you start off with doing doing foam fighting, you're 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 probably gonna at some point say, uh, you know what what can I do to to make this even more real, and then you you you, you know you find the rattan. And then as you're doing rattan fighting, you're like, well, it'd be really cool if we could do this with, you know, real swords and real armor. And that may take you um, to, to some of the HMB uh, stuff as well. So, I mean, those, those are directly applicable, um, uh, you know, and it's, it, it, all that training is, um, you know, is, is what we do for the most part. Um, and some of these other, other things that we're talking about, some of these other sports that, uh, you know, Ulrich had mentioned, um, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, kind of decision making process, right? Um, for uh, quarterbacks in particular, right? So um, uh, quarterbacks have a have a, a a read system, right? Where they have they have five different targets uh, available to them, right? And as soon as you snap the ball, they go through those five different targets in order. And they have, they have an order of precedence. They have like, this is my primary target. This is my secondary, you know, and if I end up having to dump to the, the running back, then, you know, that's a problem, but uh, I can do that. And they, what they, and as soon as that ball snaps, they go through and they read each one of those targets, you know, um, covered, covered, open, bang, you know, and you're just going to go through each one of those. Uh, and, and we do that a lot uh, in our decision-making process um, in fighting as well. Um, it's all part of that OODA loop that, that um, I think, um, I think Bronelson, you guys had talked about that when, uh, when we had Conrad on, um, you know, that, that, that decision-making loop that we go through um, is very similar to the quarterback reads. Um, so even if you, even if you hadn't played football and, or, you know, we weren't a quarterback, you should definitely understand if you've been in that system, you should understand um, that sort of decision-making process. And, you know, we kind of program in certain responses like that too, you know, so when we're, when we're looking for different targets that are available to us, you know, if this target that I want isn't open, then that tells me that another, this other target likely is, and being able to read those things um, is something else that we can get from, from other sports. And, you know, to Alan on's point too, earlier about, you know, the one-on-one -on -one versus the five-on-five, -five, you know, basketball, you know, there, there are those basketball players who can stand at, at one end of the, the, the court. They can read how everything is going to play out. And they can just throw a long pass to, to where the guy is going to be, knowing just being able to see how all of those, those pieces are going to come together. And we do a lot of that, uh, especially at the highest levels of our sport. Uh, Tristan, would you like to go next? Yeah, I wanted to add something to this. And this is uh, something I experienced uh, back when I lived in Anstiora and I got exposed to the rapier combat down there. And this is before it was adapted up in the mid realm and in a lot of areas of the SCA. Um, and at the time, I'm going to date myself here, but at the time, the standard was foil. And they had, uh, you could also use an epee, uh, but they were, those were, not, more unusual, the standard was foil. So it was a really super light sword, very fast. And I, I got into it just because, I mean, I'd fight with a rolling pin if I get my hands on it. Um, but what I noticed is the speed of the attacks was much faster because they're just not moving a weapon that's as heavy. And initially it was, it was kind of jarring. I wasn't used to that kind of speed, but as my eyes got used to the speed and I would be able to, to fight at that, that pace, it's very quick and explosive. Um, you're still using maneuvering and what have you, but once your my eye got used to that pace and, and speed and tempo, when I went back to heavy, it seemed like everything was going in slow motion. And so that was like a great influence uh, for when, you know, it seems like, oh, this, the, the rattan combat's going really fast. Well, do something that, that really requires a, uh, that very tight OODA loop, that decision, uh, observation decision speed is really, really small. And it will seem when you go back, like it's a little slower. And that actually bridges into a uh, listener question. I said, uh, how about uh, people from an Olympic fencing background? And this was when I moved back from, from Anstiora, I, I, I crossed paths with a, a collegiate fencer who decided who wanted to come to the SCA and try, try his hand at, at uh, SCA rapier fighting. And um, by this point, we'd gotten to, epes were pretty much the standard. Uh, so it wasn't quite the, the light whippy thing of the foil. And I remember uh, facing this young man, and he was probably about 10 years younger than I was. And the skills that he brought was very tight footwork, incredible point control. He, his hand, he had minimal movement, and he'd make that point go wherever he wanted to. Um, and had I, had I stuck with what he was used to, which is that linear strip, he would have ripped me apart. But what he had never been exposed to is lateral footwork because they don't do that on a, on a fencing strip. Um, he was also never exposed to ha using the empty hand to sweep blades away um, or to deflect. And so when I used those, because that's what I was used to, uh, that kind of leveled the field with us and that I could circle him. And he, you could just tell like his, his, the path that he was used to was so well-worn that when somebody stepped off of it, 
he just he, he kind of like what what should I do but boy howdy if you're in front of him it was going to be real trouble because he was just so quick and his footwork was so good um so yeah there's what I have about the uh, the Olympic fence I think and this was in the comments somebody an Olympic level athlete will probably excel at anything because of two things they know how to train and this is what I think Brown has posted up but also secondly if you're an Olympic athlete, you are in a very high level of conditioning and, and body control and body awareness. When you tell your body to do something, it will do it. And you can, you're can you used to making adjustments. And when you learn a new physical art, uh, you're going to learn it much faster just because you're used to that discipline of learning. I, I agree 100% there. I think that goes, uh, the, the understanding your body goes a really, really long way in any sport that you do. Alanon. What do you got for us? <clears throat> well, uh, the first thing I, I also wanted to add that all of these sports, if you've been doing them at a, at a, you know, we'll call it competitive level and you've been competing, uh, let's say, you, you know, in high school or college, uh, you know, God forbid the Olympics or at a professional level. One of the things that you're bringing to the SCA fighting field is something that, I mean, I've had, I, I've had people ask me to work with them on, you know, a number of times through the decades now, and that's, well, how do I rise to the level of competition and how do I compete at a high level all the time? And, you know, it's like anything else. It's trained and it's practiced and then it's, you know, it's, it's employed. So if you've been doing that, um, you know, in high school, college, anywhere after, heck, I mean, even, even if you're in a rec league pickup thing of any you know a, a rec league you know you're 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 competing and you're practicing competing and then you know it's a little easier to make that transition if a lot of people sometimes you know one of the really wonderful and magical things i think about sea combat is is you don't have to have all the things that we're talking about to do it you know a love for 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 what we do is really the only driver. And, and if you, you can really work through everything else that you don't have. And one of the things when I, when I joined the SCA, uh, a lot of fighters definitely did not come from a, a competitive athletic background. It's one of the reasons why I had an early advantage in, in some of the things. Um, you know, they loved it. They loved, they loved the literature. They loved Tolkien. They loved, you know, I mean, they loved all the esoteric things about the SCA. And they, you know, they wanted to fight for their honor of their ladies or they wanted to fight for the honor of their lords. And that was more important to them than the, the competitive um aspects you know the sports aspects of it and then they had to learn those things because to actually be able to make your consort the lord or lady of the day you know you had to win that tournament so you know a lot of them kind of had to kind of had to work to get to that point and some of them never did and you know so those people who are coming from a competitive background they don't have to be taught that you know they <laughs> they've been doing that uh you know from the time they had their little league coach to uh, you know yelling at them to they had their high school coach i mean my high school coach is i mean i don't really have anything but horror stories <laughs> you know because they drove you to be competitive and and if you weren't competitive then they'd go find some other kid that could be competitive because the actual willingness to compete was more important to them than how well you did it if that makes any sense. I mean, you yeah, know, I think it makes total sense because, you know, it, you, in a, in a team sport, especially the things that I came from, you, you had to compete to actually support your teammates. Otherwise you just, you just were a scorer. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to score. I don't actually care if we win this game, as long as I get 35 points, you know, it's like, no, no coach actually really likes that. You know, it's like, what can you do to make this team win? Okay. So um, that's that's one of the things I want. Now the sort of the the, the fun things I want to bring into um, our discussion. Take a look at uh, a pro basketball player here in the triple threat position, and uh, this I think most of all of these are, is Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant, and. I don't want to so much as look at his shot making, even though that's going to show you the whole strength thing. But so I'm going to stop there. Okay. 
put swords and shields in those guys' hands. And while the positioning's not perfect, it's very similar at a at a core level, at a basic level. I mean, they're both got their knees bent. You know, they're both standing in a position to where they can, you know, the one defensive player is attempting to try to, he's trying to drive the opponent back into the teeth of the defense, if you will. So it's one of the reasons why he's not perfectly in a, in a more balanced position because he's, he's purposely trying to drive the offensive player into the other team. Um, but Kobe's positioning, and I know it's not, it is, again, these aren't one-to-one, but if, if he's on the side, if he was actually in the center of the court trying to get, you know, where he's directly facing the basket, he'd have a more centered approach, but you know, you're going to change your, where your shoulders are and where your feet are based on where you are on the, on the, on the court. But, um, but I mean, he's, he's going to approach all of this so he can shoot from here. It, you know, it's going to be hard for him to make a straight shot because his opponent is close enough to try to, to harass him. But because he's close enough, he'll be able to do either footwork fakes or ball fakes to get himself open, you know, so little jab step, move forward, step back. And these things, you know, can be, again, I don't want to say direct, but they're really close to what, you know, what we do. And certainly what I do, I want to be in a position when I'm facing my opponent that they don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I can do multiple things and, you know, and it's going to start with your footwork, you know, it's your range control. And, and, you know, so these things I think work and they carry through, um, you know, but everything he does, he centers up, he gets his opponent kind of, he tries to get his opponent out of balance. Does that sound familiar? I mean, if you're not trying yeah. to make your opponent, you know, to get off the balls of their feet, then you, you know, you've got something really cool. You can add to your game, but you, between your footwork and your offense, you can try to get your opponent to where they're, they're no longer in a good standing position. And once you do, you can take advantage of that. And so that's so much of what he's trying to do. He's just, and, and he's doing the mental calculus very quickly. Well, you he's know? also what? probing a lot. So he, that's, I was, take, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I, I mean, when he's at the three point line, that is, that is probing range right there. Yeah, he probes with the, he about probes with the ball and he probes yeah, he with does. his feet. Yeah. You know, he, so you take that one pivot foot and before you have a pivot foot, you can go either direction. But once you've got a pivot foot, then, you know, now that foot actually starts trying to generate what he wants. He wants a little bit of space. He gets a little bit of space. He can shoot. Or if you cheat up on him, well, great. Now he knows where you are and he can go around. So, you know, these things will work through. I'm going to shift over to the, uh, to the other video because I think it's really interesting and it's the defensive one. So, um, this is uh, Draymond Green, and this guy is a freaking beast. So he is going to, he's also going to talk shit every time, but he, he knows exactly where the ball is. Okay, look how close he is here. And his footwork, his footwork is moving. He's, he's using his strength to not get pushed back by actually a bigger, stronger person, you know, but he's got his own strength set up. His hands are always ready to move. His eyes are always up. His head is always up so that he can see every single thing, not just what's going on with his man, but what's going on with the rest of the, you know, the rest of the court and where his, you know, are, are his, any of his, his teammates starting to get in trouble. I mean, he is a team defensive person and he's an absolute beast by himself. Uh, let me get rid of this ad unless we're going to do some, uh, uh, some, some purchases real quick, but he, he was a defensive player of the year a couple of years ago. And some of it, a good portion of it is what you individually are able to do. And then the other part is how you're able to make your team better. And, you know, so he's, and he is a great trainer as an actual performer, his, the rest of his teammates have to work, you know, he will let them know if they're in the wrong position. He will let them know if they're doing the wrong thing. And it's not always nice, but you know, sometimes it's not always nice. He's gotten better as he's aged a little bit, but you know, the, the important thing that he does is he's in a great crouch where he can move and he's in, you know, a position of strength. So he can't be pushed around and, you know, it's not always easy to see where that translates, but you know, if I could have this guy with a sword and a stick for about 20 minutes, he, he would tear, he would probably tear most of us up just with his, you know, his strength and his quickness and his, his brain. And that's, that's what we're trying to teach. I think, you know, one of the things we're wanting to work with all of our students, we want you to be smarter. We want you to be able to think quicker. And then we want you to, 
we want to help you get your body in position to do all the things that your brain can figure out. Yeah, and, and I'd uh, like to throw something else out there too. One of the other things that, that you're seeing as he does that is he is he's responding to what is actually happening on the court. Absolutely. Um, not what he expects to happen, not what he hopes is going to happen. And that's something we talk about a lot is, you know, you go in with a pre-programmed fight and you decide that this is how the fight's going to go. And then your opponent just doesn't respond to that. You know, this is, this is a great example of, you know, the way he's moving around, he is, you know, he's responding to how, how his opponent is actually moving and what is really happening. Not, not any sort of pre-programmed sort of uh, defense. I mean, there's, there's his own defense and that's fine and all, but this is a guy that is absolutely reading the fight. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a great, great example of kind of what I wanted to bring when I was thinking about, you know, basketball and how it works with SCA fighting. What, what Draymond Green does is, first of all, he's prepared. You know, he did hours upon hours upon hours of game study before the before the game. You know, he he actually knows the names of the other of the opposing team's plays. He can call them for them. They sometimes get annoyed because he's calling. He'll, he's like, you guys are about to call this. You know, he could be playing his guy. And, and sure enough, they'll call that play. And he's like, told you, you know, so he knows, you know, and again, up your knowledge, guys. Everyone should be working always to up your knowledge of the fight game. And once you do, then hopefully you try to get your body in a position to be able to take advantage of what your brain sees. And that's what he is. He is in extremely good physical condition. He's work. He's 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 staying in a good guard, if I'll keep it in SCA context. And then his head is up and he's calculating and he's reacting and he's reacting before. It's not like he says this is about to happen. His feet are already moving by the time it says, you know, this is getting ready to happen. His feet have already started moving. So, you know, I, I think those things work really well um, as, uh, you know, as examples for, you know, what other sports can bring to SCA combat. And you can see, I, I loved uh, uh, Ulrich's example of what the quarterback is having a process. That's also very similar to what the linebacker is having a process, you know, when he's the defensive captain and he's, he's calling out reactions to what he thinks offensively is going to happen in football. Um, you know, you can bring these things to the game when you do, um, you know, figure out where they work and then take from the take from it, you know, all the things that don't work, the jumping. I mean, you know, you don't you know, we don't do a lot of jumping in the SCA. We all know someone who jumps every now and then. But, you know, by and large, I've taken jumping and I've taken it out of what I do. The muscles that I use for jumping, I've put into my sword shots. But but the. Um, you know, the actual jumping set aside. So, you know, take all your favorite sports and figure out ways to make them work for you in, in SCA combat. And it's probably going to be a lot of fun for you. All right. Um, and, and just a real quick note for everybody. This is something actually that Bess brought up way, way early in the conversations um, in the comments. And that is we're, we're talking about real training and, and real hard work for in some cases. And you know, we, we, you know, even a number of us don't go and train every week, right? I mean, you know, for most of us, we're, we probably did that a lot getting there. Um, <clears throat> and, and multiple times a week is, is something you rarely see. And, and the people that do it do end up floating to the top a lot of times. Um, so one thing I have to say is you, you have to communicate at practice, because there's going to be people that just show up the one time a month or twice a month to come and play and enjoy the SCA and get some fights in. You have to help them understand that there's going to be people that want to train, want to do footwork, want to get better in different ways. And, and as long as both sides know and respect that, I, I, I think we still have a good SCA practice. And, and you may see stuff fall to one side more on, at one time and, and the other side the other times. So there are sometimes we have a number of people to just come to do footwork, footwork drills with us that never get in armor. In fact, they've been in armor a couple of times. They come right when they're hurt or just don't feel like it. They still come and do footwork drills as agility and as exercise. And, and then they hang out. And, and, you know, that's the idea is that you, you just be aware. Don't shut out the people that are there to enjoy it because that's how the society started. So I just want to make 
make that comment, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that covers what Beth uh, kind of covered early off, and I wanted to make sure we, we got there because we're going to continue talking about, you know, what you can do in training and everything else, um, but make sure that you, that, that you do have a good, communicated, good communication in your practice. Uh, all right, it's all you. <clears throat> off of mute. There we go. All right. Sorry. On an iPad, a little different tonight. Um, so th there's a couple of things that, I, that, that folks touched on on the way to get here. We talked about, uh, uh, Sean talked about Tom Brady reading defenses earlier. But the, the, one of the big things that I've learned or that I brought into this was assessment before the fight starts. Assessment, reading, reading the, the defense before the play is called, knowing, um, you know, seeing what they're, what they're doing. Simple things as, you know, from, from things as simple as what, what hand their sword is in to what guard, is, guard they're in to where they're going to be based on when the fight starts. From when the fight starts, are they relaxed? Or before the fight starts, are they relaxed or are they already nervous? Simple things like that, simple body language that tells you what a person's going to do or a person's likely to do so that you're not, as, as Sean also pointed out, going in with a specific plan, you're adjusting to the situation as it develops. Um, this, you know, this goes back all the way back to um, reading a, 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 a running back's uh, moves, making sure that you're staying, staying in front of them. But one of the biggest things that um, football taught me is pattern recognition. As the, as the, as the game goes on, learning what people are doing and, and learning how to, how to counter that. The other thing that it taught me to do was watch film and learn what people do and find things in, in what people do that I can put into my fighting. Um, I, I have rather famously, famously said, I have nothing new. And, and there, I really think there's nothing new under the sun that we find, find in fighting that... Uh, there's no, I don't do anything new. Everything that I've got, I've stolen from the people here or, uh, or, or people, you know, fighting. So film study taught me that. Um, and I learned film study from, from football. But um, the, like I said, the, the biggest thing was pattern recognition from the mental side of things, pattern, pattern recognition and the ability to read a situation. Uh, and I'm, I've taught several classes on both of those things. No, I, 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 I like both of those, uh, and, and I would agree 100%. Um, I'm going to cover one of the questions. There's actually two, two, uh, uh, two questions in here. Um, I'm going to go back up to them. And one was, I think, from Sir Louis was, uh, uh, what have you integrated in SEA fighting from your sports background that you taught and found others excited to learn? It, it's actually kind of funny, um, you know, uh, the one thing I would say on that as an answer, and I think Sean has some answers on this as well, uh, but um, the, the thing that got the most feedback when I teach people is actually comes out of some ballroom dance I did a long time ago. And I am not a professional ballroom dancer by far. I am not good. And, uh, uh, but it was a super interesting class. I really enjoyed it. And what it taught is that flow between two people that space where you're not pushing the other person around, you're both feeling that movement and you can change that movement as each other changes the movement. And, and I brought that in, I, I literally, I've asked a number of people, and it's always kind of weird, you know, dancing with a guy in armor, but, you know, I've asked, I was like, okay, have you done any dance? And they're like, yeah, I did a little bit of ballroom dancing. I'll go, this is exactly the same. And we'll go through some exercises where I'm not pushing their, their idea is just to follow me. And, and I, I use that same thing, that same flow uh, thing out of a little bit of wrestling I did in the past. So it was mostly around somebody else that did a lot of jujitsu and wrestling. And I'll lock up behind somebody's head and we'll apply tension and then we'll release it. And what we're doing is probing. Then we'll, we'll force into a direction and, and release it. And, they got, and they're far better than me. So they're like, oh, I love this, you know? And, and then I'm like, there is no difference, but now we're going to do it without touching each other. And, and then all of a sudden those light bulbs light up. They're like, oh, there's, there's actually, I'm still doing this. I'm just not wrapped up 
so much in my other sport that I can't recognize that we're still doing it. And, and the sooner you bring that to people and, and show those connection points, they get very excited. So Sean, what do you got on that one? Uh, me, myself. Um, yeah, so again, you know, I, uh, I didn't have a heavy sports background before the SEA, but after I'd, uh, after I'd been knighted, um, time I was in the military, I, I did, I dabbled in a lot of little things, um, like say golf, um, racquetball, um, maybe tennis, you know, just, you know, flag football, softball, all these other things. So, um, I did some martial arts later on. I did some, some Taekwondo, um, but that was, you know, long after, uh, long after I've been fighting. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of my experience has been, you know, I mean, I having just touched enough of a variety of different sports and understanding the fundamental mechanics of some of those things. Um, my experience has been trying to help other people who have had extensive experience with those with those sports in, in being able to um, to translate that uh, into what we do. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we, we talk about this in other other sports, but something that, that had just occurred to me, too, is, you know, one of the you know, one of, one of my big things, especially with, with pell work and body mechanics or for what we do, um, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about muscle memory. Um, and, you know, there's, 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 there's only one way, in, in my opinion, there's only one way to get your sword to be faster, and that's muscle memory. And that's making your body uh, c connect those neural pathways um, to, to, to get those things to, to fire faster, right? it's just muscle memory. And, you know, when we talk about, we talk about like pell work, for instance, uh, you know, I tell people to, 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 you know, minimal, minimal impact. It's like, you know, speed and power don't come from throwing fast and hard. And, you know, when you think about it, uh, just typing on a keyboard, right? If you got somebody who types 40 words a minute, that person didn't sit down at the keyboard day one and start typing, typing 40 words a minute. And guess what? If you've played a musical instrument of any kind, you are familiar with muscle memory. Going through all the musical scales, going through the 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 horribly repetitive, um, you know, you know the well practice, right? Um, yeah, there's there's even playing a musical instrument will will teach you a lot about uh, how to learn our sport or how to learn a, a an activity that requires a, a great deal of of muscle memory. So there's a lot of things out there that, that people just, you know, don't think about that, that we as trainers, when we can make that connection and we can say, you know, you, you know, how many years did you spend playing the clarinet? Well, it's going to take, you know, X amount of, of scales on, on, you know, doing pell work to, to, to get better at this too. And when you make that connection and you, you know, we can let them know among other things, like you've done this successfully in another activity. And when you apply those learning techniques to what we do, um, you can be successful at this too because you've already you've already taught yourself how to do a thing, and yeah. So that's 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 been a lot of how I have applied a lot of what we're talking about is just convincing people you already know how to do this. Yeah, I I, I would tend to agree. Um, you know, that is a it's a a pretty big pieces that I think a lot of times it's just helping people get, you know, it's, it's not so much what we always bring from another sport that we're super good at. Although, you know, obviously there's things out of basketball and there's things out of martial arts and uh, things like that. But I've, I've known, you know, guys that fight, you know, a number of us know of some people that fight MMA and, in, in, you know, in Vegas hotels and things like that. And, um, and, and just, you know, being able to talk through stuff really helped them understand that that connection between what they do and what they could do in the SCA as well, and uh, and that that ends up being something that's uh, you know pretty big, um, and and I think that's why I tie dance into flow and things like that because a lot of times what you're trying to do is there's certain you know if we look at drill work I mean I didn't do drill work in martial arts I didn't do any of that footwork drill work. I didn't play basketball where they do it all the time, um, you know, but, you know, thanks to our, some local people and, and COVID coming around, uh, we are, you know, I, I see it as an incredible foundation that, that we work in and has strengthened my core, 
strength in my body made me faster on my feet than ever before, which some people don't like. Um, built, built my boxing game that much better um, because now I'm actually, I, I'm practicing the early parts of boxing and not the ends. And, and, and building that foundation instead of trying to jump to the end is exactly what Sean's talking about here is it takes time. You wanna build that foundation, make sure you're strong enough to be able to do the end piece over a period of time. Um, so, and actually, I, you know, on, on that note, um, I thought we had one more question after what have you brought? Um, and we will try to find that. I, I know Saib had uh, posted it up in our forum, uh, but it's getting a bit, uh... oh, uh, there was another question about, um, I, I remember it now, it's, it's about how to make your mind faster. And, uh, and everybody's thought on that was essentially, uh, that could be a session by itself. And, and it may be a short, one of our little short sessions we're talking about doing, could be a whole session by itself. Um, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but I think everybody here is already starting and that is you're listening, you're learning, you're thinking about fighting, you're thinking about things that can make you better. That's, that's using your brain. That is keeping your brain on what you really love to do. It's no different than, you know why a lot of great fighters like talking fighting? Because it, it really grabs that thought complex in their brain and makes it work and they're excited. And it's the same excitement they get in fight, right? This is the reason, you know, or talk about watching film. Film is exactly the reason why you watch film is to engage your brain around the thing you want to do. You know, everybody works that a little different. There's other exercises. Lomachenko does some letter and, and number exercises, visual exercises, audio exercises. Um, so, but, you know, ultimately, um, I, I think everybody's on that road. If you've been watching here and, and you continue watching here, I think you're already on that road. So let's, let's go into the next piece. And um, I, I think we, we, we bring a lot to talking about practicing certain things and how we bring sports in. Um, and, and I'm going to bring it, uh, we're going to jump to a subject that we were talking actually before we, uh, before the episode. And that is, um, what, so for each of you, what do you think are things that we as coaches could do better taking from other sports that maybe we haven't done? I mean, I, I know in, when we were talking, I, somebody asked, I, like, you, you think we are doing better now than we did before? Because we we're talking about how lots of football now doesn't involve pads. Lots of boxing doesn't involve constant boxing. Um, you know, there, there's, there's new ways of training uh, and safer over the long run, it's safer from overtraining. So um, it, my answer to that is I think we, we still have a long way to go uh, because we haven't even made the first step of getting people to really grab on and uh, to, to, to see the benefit of building that foundation before just jumping into fighting. Um, uh, Sean, I mean, what do you think on that building the foundation piece there? Uh, you know, I was I was actually going to pitch to Ulrich on this when we when we talk about uh, training methodologies and how they how they've changed. Because um, yeah, that was a question that I had was you know, um, you know, because I I played a little bit of little league football and some of what Alan was talking about that competitive nature and all that. You know, I I think I think I think a lot of uh, organized sports have really changed how they teach, um, and I think we're. I, I, I think we're, we're making those same adjustments, but uh, I think I'm going to pitch to Ulrich and let him kind of talk about how, how some of that has changed over the years. Sure. Um, so when I first started in organized sports, we showed up to practice. Um, we were in full pads, except for like the first day, you know, you showed up, you did, um, you did some calisthenics, you did some drills, uh, full contact drills, and then you uh, split out by position. You did more drills, you learned your plays. Uh, and then at the end, at the very end of the practice, like the last half hour of practice was when you did all your scrimmage. When I first started in the SCA, I showed up to practice. They put a sword in my hand, they put a shield in my hand, and then I, and, and then I sparred the rest of the day. Um, so 
there wasn't that learning how to do things, um, learning how the, the sport worked. Um, there was, there was, well, there was sparring and that was what, what we did. Um, but as time passed, as I, as I got better, as I progressed in, in football, um, you know, young, young middle school and starting high school, you know, was all pads all the time, all fight on, on all fight, all contact, all, you know, all wearing, wearing yourself down. Uh, Ellen, I pointed out when we were talking earlier, it was that coach was there to get, to get the most out of you that, that he could while the short time he had you. Um, but then as I got under the varsity side of football and, uh, and a little bit of uh, a little bit of semi uh, or amateur football when I was in the army, um, it was, you showed up, you put on your helmet, you went through those same things that you did before, but you didn't blow yourself out until you got towards the season where it was happening on a, on a weekly basis. And then your number of practices went, went down so that you were in, in shape or in condition to play on the weekend. Um, and those things are things that we can apply to this right now. Um, I'm, I'm only, I'm only sparring, uh, once a week. Whereas, you know, usually on, on Tuesday nights, I go over to, to Count Bart's house and we do a skills and drills nights where we just go through and do, do drills. And we might do a, do a little light sparring with bopper weapons, but it's, it's, still, it's still formalized sparring. It's, you know, there's something that we're doing. It's, you know, receive one shot or receive three shots, throw one shot. It's something like that where you're not allowed, where either you're stuck standing still throwing shots or you're moving throwing shots. It's things that we can do that aren't as hard on our bodies while still training things that make us better at the sport um, are, are where things are going right now. I think that we can do more of, and especially with the, some of the buffer stuff can get past some of the guys that just want to show up and spar, right. Without blowing them, blowing them up. If we can get them to, to, you know, use a buffer weapon for, for a little bit or a foam weapon for, for a little bit, so that they're not getting the repetitive, repetitive impacts constantly and blowing their bodies bodies out. So you know, actually, that's a, this is leading actually right into what Tristan would just asked in our corner. He's asking questions. We have our coaches like asking questions too, which you know is is always good. I, I they they put us they 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 kind of poke at us as well. So Tristan, you were you were uh, just kind of covering this a little bit, right? I mean, you know. It's kind of the sales sales of stuff, right? I mean, how do yeah, you... it is. You know, in fact, uh, yeah, and I posted this up because it was a question from Louis on the on the forum, and he says, uh, "Do you uh, coaches do you have something that you saw in another sport that you found relative in some way to the SCA fighting that you tried to teach, but found resistance from others when you tried to teach this?" And I would, boy, something just came right to mind, and this was years ago when I tried to bring in some drills and structure into practice and not just have show up, put your armor on, go out, spar for an hour or two, and then go home. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it was different. It was just not the typical model. And, you know, usually when I would show up to a practice and I'd be like, okay, everybody, I want to show you something. And, you know, people would gather up and you'd say, okay, let, we're going to talk about some footwork. Or we're going to talk about, you know, try to show them something. I think the expectation was, oh, Tristan's going to show us a, like a, a secret shot. Or, or something that's going to suddenly make us, you know, really good defense or really good offense. He's going to show us one of his tricks. And when it wasn't that, you could kind of see the, oh, well, I, I got to actually train. No, this is boring. I just want to put my helmet on. And you'd, the, resi the resistance wasn't so much, I don't want to learn that as much as a, I don't really understand what the, the good that's going to come from this is. And, uh, you know, I had, I would do this at, at the local practice. I even had my own practice in my backyard uh, where I would get a couple people, a few, but the interest generally was, uh, I don't really want to do boring drills. I want to get an armor and, and have fun. And so that was the resistance I ran into. And about, uh, I don't know, this has been about 15 years ago or so, I started realizing that, that there was value in using boffers, uh, foam for for training. And it was mocked. I mean, outright just, you know, you have the other Knights or Royal peers or even experienced fighters kind of like, Oh, what is that? You know, that's not tough enough. And they kind of used the same. It was the similar attitude of I learned by sparring, uh, you know, that made me good. So that's going to, that, that's the way that it's supposed to be done. And the idea that, 
you could actually use a more structured um, way of conveying the skills and not just throw somebody in the deep end of the pool seemed like it was wussy or and, and therefore it did not have value and i don't think it caught on um very much and and i know Branas has has gone well into that and found tremendous value with bringing new people in uh using some foam and buffers it takes away the initial that initial pain curve it takes away the high demand for a lot of armor right off the bat you can get away with working lightly you can engage their their excitement and enter and um eagerness to to try it out without the the physical high physical demand so i didn't think that the resistance to it made a lot of sense but in that's what i ran into so i actually uh, sean said he had some input i'm gonna have a real quick input and and i would agree i've been lucky to have a wonderful fight practice with some great people um and and a lot of people actually coming from you know three hours plus away uh and for sure an hour and a half away every weekend just come but they were coming to just do drills they were coming to to practice those things and uh um and then had an online group that uh we were doing drills every sunday for a long time when we had no practices and uh there are definitely benefits. Um, I, I, sometimes I look and I was like, ah, I don't know how much benefit I got from footwork, although I couldn't do a lot of the footwork. And I still laugh every time I see a Duke try to do the footwork and fumbling way, their way through it. Um, but uh, it, it's, uh, you know, for me, I, I, it has, you know, and the people are like, you just have to look, you're, you're moving twice as fast as everyone else right now. And, uh, and I really, I have to say that came from footwork and, and more core strength. So, uh, Sean. Yeah, I, I was going to, you know, when, when Tristan is talking about is, you know, training methodology, right? Uh, finding a better way to, to, to actually teach our sport instead of, as Ulrich, you know, pointed out, it's like, I mean, that had been the training methodology for our sport for the first 40 years is put your stuff on and go figure it out or not. And like, and the or not was like, the, like there was an acceptable loss rate, right? Yeah. It was like, oh, the, he just didn't figure it out. He must not want it bad enough, right? Um, and you know, and and I got I got introduced to like training process and training methodology mostly through through Sagan. Um, but the you know when we when we all did uh, known world rutan symposium back in 2005, the class that I taught was uh, learning philosophy or learning methodology for our sport, and uh, it was the first class that I'd really taught like on a known world scale. Um, and that has since become the foundation of my fighting clinic um, that, that, that I teach. And it is still remarkable to me. And this kind of goes to, to Tristan's point that it's not so much it's, I don't know if it's so much of a resistance as it is, like for, for my experience has been when I talk to people about training methodology and about training better and teaching them a process for learning our sport, it is still remarkable to me how many people have never heard anything like this. Like this is such a new concept to them that, you know, but it's also brilliant and it's simplicity because everywhere I go, they go, I've never heard of this before. Why haven't we been doing this? It's like, well, okay, well, because you never heard of it, right? Um, and, as, and as soon as I introduce these concepts, you know, and, and this is something that I think that 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 Bronis and I have have both done over the years is is it's not so much that we're teaching you like our style or our system or, or even our techniques it's like we're teaching you how to learn things and then like in whatever content you want to learn in addition to that like that's that's fine but it's the process right and so you know like Tristan was saying is like introducing people to this concept and they go I've never heard of this before you know but once you introduce them to it it's an, it's a pretty easy sell for the most part, but then the, the question that I always get asked is how do I break that cycle? How do I how, how do I get over that stigma of oh well what's this training thing and you know and like Tristan said oh you're not you got to man up right I mean it, this isn't this isn't like hard enough or you know let's just go out and, and fight or whatever and and that's the question I always get is how do you how do you convince people that this is a better way of training? And, you know, for me, it's always been, it takes you and one other person. And when yep. you have one other person that you're training with and you're doing the drills and you're doing the walkthrough and the training, and you're actually, you know, teaching people how to fight instead of just sparring, those two people are going to become better. 
And eventually somebody else from the crowd is going to say, what are those guys doing that I'm not doing? And, and, and it's, it can be a hard sell sometimes. So as far as getting resistance for, for a new concept, when, when you come to a practice that has been a sparring oriented practice and you try to change that into a training oriented practice, you're going to get some pushback for sure. So uh, Alan, it's, it's been a long time. You have a question to answer, but I, I know you want to add a little bit to this. Uh, and then we're going to ask answer a question that was asked uh, much earlier about some fencing things. So um, my my add to this is, um, you know, why should we be doing the drills and, and it could, you know the things that we bring from other sports into this sport and 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 get resistance from them? Why why should we do it? You know when we're young and we're strong and the sparring is so fun. Um, you know, the drills are so dull, uh, you know, the answer to that question, you know, is a painful one is that you're not always going to be young and you're not always going to have that unbelievable strength and the ability to recover and do this, you know, I mean, it's super hard. If you've gone to a week long war recently, after you've, after you've hit your 40th birthday and tried to fight on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, you know, well, then you're in some fantastic conditioning because it is really, really hard to do that. We do not recover the way we did when we were 20. I mean, the, when, when I was 20, I could sleep and I would get very little of it, but I was so young, I didn't need that much. And it would be enough to allow me to go off and do the same thing the next day. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons. And, and then the, 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 because this episode is a lot about what other sports bring into it. I want to bring in the sort of the story and the ongoing controversy going on with basketball right now is that they have a lot of what's called AAU, which is amateur uh, athletic union. And um, it, where they find these great young kids and they get them in competitive basketball situations super early. And they, they, it really helps them. They put them into, you know, really, you know, good coaches and and they put them in these comp competitive situations and it's really weird you know the coaches oftentimes have shoe deals um you know so and that's a business for them and you know it's a way of life for the kids and what they have been discovering is that those kids that have been coming through this aau system for the last 20 years or more are really suffering the long-term effects of overtraining and you know oh the, the physicality of you know it's 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 really not overtraining it's overperformance and that can really is the miles that these kids were putting you know and have you know since they were like 10 11 12 and they're doing these AAU tournaments that are they're playing two to three times a day three games a day and then they come back the next day and if you know move on into this through their tournaments and stuff and um and you know they do that every weekend for all summer and then you know they go into their their actual high school seasons or whatever and a lot of these you know, the ones that have got you know been able to compete and go into at, at a professional level you know they were suffering some injuries and other things because of the miles on their legs. You know, you're 26 years old. You don't think about having miles on your legs, but you know, the, the difference between performance and training is, is significant. The, the amount of impact you put on yourself in performance, and this translates to what we do too. So don't, it's not just a, a basketball game is harder than basketball practice kind of a thing. Um, you know, because of the level of competition and the fact that people are hitting you and you're bumping, you know, in SCA combat, the performance is harder than the practice from a standpoint of the harder on your body and harder on your joints and harder on your muscles. It's and you know, so it's important that we add other ways to tra tra train so that we can work on our prowess that we aren't hurting ourselves. And when I was younger, I loved two a week practices or three a week practices and then fighting on Saturday, you know, but if I could go back and tell 20 year old me, it's like, here's ways to do drills. Actually, let's use the buffer weapons because they're going to allow you to train harder, longer without the pain. Um, 
you know, these things, I really think that, uh, you know, they're super important and we can take the lessons that you're seeing in professional sports and, and, and hyper competitive collegiate and high school sports where they're, they're putting themselves at risk and we can take those lessons and not do those things also. So the question that we had with regard to, uh, it was, it was a good question. Uh, um, a, a listener asked, I came over to armored from rapier to learn more about melee and to see what I can bring back. Do you guys have any thoughts or advice on that? And well, the first thing that you got to do is you've got to actually very positively encourage some of your practice time to actually do melee. Otherwise you're not going to get to practice melee until they start yelling war practice and stuff like that. And then you go to those events. Uh, but the thing, you know, Small two on two, three on three, four on four melee practice at your local practice is very beneficial. You know, it's a matter of scale when you get to the big wars, um, but but the lessons that you learn are still important. As soon as you have two people fighting each other, one person can flank, and once you learn the fundamentals of flanking then you have actually taken the most important thing you can take back to rapier because most of the rapier melees that I've been involved in, they'd form these long, even if they were kind of snaky lines, but they'd form the long lines. And it looked like what happens when in heavy, you get the big long spear lines and most people are just spear dueling. You get a whole lot of rapier fighters who are, um, you know, basically dueling. And the most important thing that you'll ever take away from SCA heavy melee is the importance of teaming up getting a, actual numbers against your uh, other opponents you know it's so much less about dueling you know if i'm when i'm spearing in a battle i'm trying to see how many different people i can get to mess with me so that everyone else around me can kill them you know so that's what you want to take away as best you possibly can and you may be that you have to actually go and actually watch as much as you're participating in some of those war practices and some of the war uh events when you're there you know take that away watch what happens watch how much more quickly one side loses if they actually get flanked and when they get flanked the people who were facing you know who are part of the line, not part of the flank, if they actually did what they were supposed to. And if they support the flank, because the flank is there to support them, and if they both both those two units start working together, well, you know, it's it's over in a matter of seconds at that point. So, you know, take what you can from those situations. What you're gonna be able to take mostly from these situations is what you learn mentally and then try to get get a buddy and as soon as you got someone in in the in, in the rapier side of things who is uh you know doing is running with you and moving and causing chaos uh, that then you can or with organization take advantage of the chaos well then you're gonna you're gonna take the most important thing away from from a uh, sca heavy uh melee all right. Um, so we had, uh, we're, we're kind of into the, the question round. There's actually a number of questions popping up quite a bit. Uh, uh, again, I think uh, the, the big thing to come out of this is take a look at some of the things, you know, take a look at the, the, the things you see and would like to do better and try to relate them or maybe go to some people that have some experience. You're like, man, that guy moves good. Ask them, why do you move so good? What do you do? Because as much as it's the, the trainer can help you get there, when, when, you come, when you come over to somebody and ask them for help, you won't believe how much help that you'll probably get offered. Um, because again, that's the emptying the cup and, and coming over and asking is a, is a huge part of this. Uh, there's a, a question and I'm gonna throw this uh, uh, over to Sean, and I, I'm going to throw it over to Ulrich as well after Sean, because I want to hear what he's doing. Uh, he, he, he piqued my uh, interest in the, 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 his off fighting day with boffers and, and drills, so I want to know more. So, Sean? Yeah, so, I mean, the question is, how do you figure out what drills are useful, and how do you go about developing new drills? Um, I mean, for me, that's just always been uh, situational. Um, I mean, when you identify the problem um then you create a drill uh to 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 address that problem um i had a number of years ago i, I had somebody that i was working with and i noticed that you know i mean he was he'd gone like three rounds in crown and uh you know and that was it and i just 
I was watching what he's doing and, and I noticed he was just like throwing a lot of just a lot of combos and he was just trying to throw, you know, faster and harder. Um, and through working with him, that was where I developed um, what I call the two second drill, which has become the the one drill that I do that is the most universal and and the thing that people tell me is the most uh, most benefit to their fighting. And and it's, you know, primarily a recovery drill. But it can be used for any number of things for target recognition and and blow recognition and and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but you know, it, I I identified a problem and I created a drill to address that problem. Uh, you know, we did an episode a while back on on the you know the the five on each side, the five elements of the fight um, that are happening on each side of the fight. And, you know, when we're talking about range and target recognition and delivery and recovery and that sort of stuff you know, we can, we can break down the failure of a fight to any one of those or, you know, 10 things, and we can address a drill for offensive range. We can address it. We can create a drill for defensive range. Um, you know, pretty much any portion of that, that fight that you identify as a, as a deficiency, um, you know, you can, you know, I mean, most of us have a, a drill to address pretty much any one of those problems. So um, don't, don't try to reinvent the wheel um too much um but you know I, the big thing is identifying what the problem is i mean that's basic basic troubleshooting methodology right there right i mean yep. you identify that there is a problem and then you you know identify what the problem is and then you have to go through testing to find out if you've got the right problem right basic troubleshooting methodology um that's something i did uh, a lot in the military as an electronics technician um and and that's that's one of my strengths as a as a trainer and as a coach is troubleshooting um finding out what what's wrong and identifying what the real problem is and once you know what the problem is you you can create a drill or you can ask one of us or you know just put up on the coach's corner to find out if somebody has a drill to address one of these things so uh Ulrich? yeah and our, our, our way of doing things is, is really similar. Um, we have some basic drills that we start out with um, almost every almost every Tuesday that, that, we, that we go. Um, we do we do the the, the Bronis uh, footwork drill where you partner up with someone and you're and you're moving side to side. One person's leading, the other person's following, keeping your range, um, not letting someone get outside get outside your your foot box, things things like that. Um, but the the one thing that we do that like uh, to allude to what Sean was talking about is, and bring it back to film. So we watch film on each other, or we know, you know, I might say, Hey, you know, Elena and I saw the last couple of times we fought, this was happening. Is this something that you want to work on? Um, but the one that I'm working on right now for myself, I caught myself getting into when I'm not finding the opening that I want, I'll try to create an opening, but I was trying to create an opening always with the same couple of shots to get my opponent moving. Um, so one of the things that, that we're doing right now with me is we've got a, a, a red, red punching glove and a blue punching glove. And as we maneuver those gloves around, one person calls which color you have to hit both gloves and, but you hit the color they call first and they move them around. And it's, you know, it's not a static, uh, drill. We're moving side to side. We're, we're doing essentially the 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 movement drill where you stay you stay in front of the other person and don't let them get away and at any point during that movement you can't throw until the person sets their hands and, and calls it and it's allowing me to it's allowing me to not get in a a single throwing style pattern it's breaking up a bad habit that i that i had developed and that's the one that we're doing right now but uh, uh man i like the uh, i do uh, i have added some uh, we did pad uh, added pad work early off and uh, in COVID, and uh, and I find that the pad work stuff is is really good. It's it's amazing how many people can't walk and hit a pad, right? <laughs> you know, so I like the double pad, the different color pads. That's an awesome idea. So, well, uh, we uh, dragged this on a little bit longer tonight just uh, because we started a little bit late, and we thank everybody for kind of hanging out with us. Um, I, I want to, uh, again, apologize, uh, keeping everybody up a little bit later, but uh, I really thought, you know, there's a lot of good information here. And uh, uh, my Squire side, who's also running the episode, had uh, had brought up, um, you know, it, it was interesting early in COVID, we not only did we do pad drills and uh, Louis kind of started the rotational drills around Pels and we, we started drew the 
the ladder drills even before COVID. Um, and so we we're coming up with a lot of different drills to help share with people and things like that. And uh, one thing that really came out of that is that we also learned that, you know, there's so many other things that come out of other things we do, like the flow work with dance. And, um, uh, and dance also brought us into the idea of, of really, um, you know, we see actually lots of professionals bring in like ballet dancers or dancers to help them understand not only stretch and things like that and how to do those things better, but also st structure of your body. So, you know, stacking of your body becomes really important in dance and Sai helped me realize how important it was. And then just looking at it, I realized that, you know, this is something we don't talk a lot about, but is fundamental to uh, really where you are when you're throwing stuff, when, if your hips are kicked out and you're, you know, what we call duck butting it, you know, all your angles are down, you know, and, uh, you know, so, I mean, and, and that happens a lot more than people think that structure of the body is so, so important. And you can see that in basketball and in football all the time. I just had Sabah who played professional football and we we're going through drills and, uh, and he's like, man, I've been trying to get people to do drills, you know, since coming out of football. And, uh, and he's like, this is all just fundamental. This is what we did in pro football all the time. And, and so, you know, it's that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it you know, <laughs> Saib said, you can, uh, you can take our yoga teacher for uh, the term duck butt. It's our uh, duck butt. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, you can find things in everything people can relate to. Um, but I, I've found more around body fundamentals in COVID than I ever had. And I think it's because we had a chance and I had a chance to talk to a lot of people and get input. And you have to be careful to discount people that may come in, you know, with, you know, that maybe not, they're not naturals, but they may have stuff that makes incredible sense. And they, you know, as, as soon as we started body talking, body stacking and stuff, I, I let Cy run with it because she, she taught me a lot uh, about what that was. And, and, and then I could get a, a good inside look on how we essentially put it into place. So, all right, so uh, we got some coming up episodes. Sean, you want to talk about those? Yeah. So uh, this this Monday we've got another uh, another episode of uh, video review with Sir Helga. Uh, me and Helga and Thorfinn are are going to have a couple of other uh, uh, unbelted fighters on that have uh, sent us some video. I still got some details to work on on some of that, but uh, we should be good to go for that for Monday at the regular time. Uh, and then uh, next Friday, we have the continuation um, of the discussion on uh, knighthood and how we, how we evaluate. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we did personal evaluations. So uh, next week, we're going to cover some of the kingdom differences um, in how some of the, the, the process that some of the different kingdoms use uh, in evaluating candidates for, uh, for chivalry. Uh, so that was, a, that was a super fun discussion on the first part of that. And I know uh, we're all we're all a bunch of fans of the inner kingdom anthropology. So, you know, it's really, really fun to, uh, to kind of kind of see uh, how things work. So it should be a good episode. I agree. Well, I'd like to thank everybody out there uh, that, that stuck out, stuck, uh, stuck with us, even running late and with all the technical problems. Tristan, thanks for coming, even though I know you weren't uh, uh, originally on the episode, but I really wanted you here with us. I always love hearing you talk. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a good, so, to, good Sean, to be in here. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's Sean, I know you're, uh, you're like getting ready for an event tomorrow and all of that. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think, uh, Ulrich is at, a at some other site waiting for an event tomorrow and me and Alan on get to sit in our home, nice and comfy, mm -hmm. keeping warm in front of our computers. So that's what we're doing tonight. I hope everybody else is keeps safe and uh, and we look forward to seeing you next week. All right. So. Have a good night, everybody. Night, night everybody. <laughs>